Live from Las Vegas, it's theCUBE. Covering Dell EMC World 2017. Brought to you by Dell EMC. Okay, welcome back everyone. We're live here, day three of three days of coverage at theCUBE at Dell EMC World 2017. I'm John Furrier with my co-host Paul Gillen and special guest on our day three opening, Peter Burris, head of research for Silicon Media, general manager of wikibon.com research. Uh, guys, good to see you on day three. We're going strong. I mean, I think I feel great, a lot of activity, so many storylines uh, to talk about. Obviously the big one is the combination, not merger, <laughs> I slipped yesterday, um, uh, or acquisition. The com combination of equals, um, Dell, EMC, some will question, did EMC acquire Dell or Dell acquire EMC? Certainly Michael Dell still captain of the, of the ship, but that's the top story. But a lot of product line conversations, not a lot of overlap. Peter, you've been at the, all the analyst sessions. We had David Florian on yesterday teasing it out, but I'd like to get you, uh, your perspective and reaction to your thoughts as you look at the giants in the industry. Michael Dell bought EMC for record 60 billion plus. You've been around the block, you've seen many waves. You've analyzed many generations of the computer industry. What does this actually mean? Where are they? What's your thoughts and reaction? So John, I'll, I'll give you three different storylines here, right? The meta picture, the good, and the what the hell's going on kind of picture. The first one, the meta picture is, uh, and SiliconANGLE said this, it was a really well written article, you might have even written it, Paul, that there has never really been a successful mega merger in the tech industry. Right. And historically, I think that's because well, here's the, here's the bottom line. This one may actually work, and it may actually work nicely. And the reason is, is that most of the other mer uh, mergers or uh, com combinations were companies with problems and companies that didn't have problems, or companies with problems and companies with problems. And if you take a look at Dell and EMC, neither of them had problems. They weren't buying each other's problems. It was a nice combination and complimentary in that EMC had a great consumer business, great channel business, and had a pretty strong financial position. And EMC had a great enterprise business, great, you know, Sales organizations. Great sales organization, and they, had a, they, they were strong in where the industry's going around how do you handle data and how do you handle storage. So it's got, what we're seeing here is everybody singing out of the same hymnal, I'm not seeing any tension, and that is an indication that this one may actually go well. I think it's a very, very good early sign. Paul, you and I were talking on the day one open, and also we kind of hit it a little bit yesterday with David Floyer um, talking about this mega merger. Um, compare and contrast that to HPE, which has been kind of the, being depositioned by some of the, the Dell executives. Um, they don't actually call them out by name, but HP Enterprise is taking a different approach. They're taking a, you know, smaller is better approach. Obviously, Michael Dell has a completely different philosophy. Um, we're still going to analyze that as well. We've got HPE Discover coming up as well. Thoughts on the compare and contrast guys' reaction to the, to the strategies of, of HPE, smaller, faster, as they say, or Dell, bigger, more powerful? Uh, I think both are viable strategies. It's just a matter of if they can pull it off. I mean, HP, you talk about, about bad mergers, Peter. I mean, you think of HP Compact, uh, HP, uh, HP Autonomy. Uh, this is a company that has had a terrible track record of, uh, of big mergers, although they've had some successful ones, certainly. Uh, and by the way, Meg Whitman inherited those. Yes. Prior to Meg Whitman coming on oh, board. Oh, she was a board member for some of them. Okay, so she was at the table. Now we don't know. Okay, but your thoughts, continue. But, uh, but uh, Dell clearly going the other direction. They, I mean, they, they're building sort of an IBM-like model, the way IBM was in the 80s, when it dominated every market uh, that it played in, uh, and it played in even more, more markets than Dell does now. Uh, so I think that the, the model makes sense. I think Peter's absolutely right. I'm not sensing any tension at this conference. There seems to be, the most important thing is there seems to be a lot of communication going on. The executives uh, are spending a lot of time with each other and they're talking a lot to the people. And when you look back, and I live in, and P, uh, Peter, you remember the deck, uh, you know, the fiasco with deck uh, yeah. being purchased by Compaq, that was clearly a takeover. And that was Compaq came in, took over the company, and didn't tell anybody anything. And the deck, the deck people were, were living in the dark uh, and it was clear that they, that they had no value to the acquiring company. That clearly, yeah. they're not making those mistakes here. For the, uh, younger, for the younger audience, DEC is Digital Equipment Corporation, which was a behemoth winner in the micro, mini computer era, era and then now defunct uh, except company. That, except the one, one thing I add to that, Paul, is that, and this is why, it's why this first sign is so important, that they are seem to be, that executives here seem to be collaborating and working together. DEC had been one of those mini computer companies 
dominated by an OEM business, which means you had a common set of components, and then everybody was competing for customers with how you put those components together. So there was it was a it was a maelstrom of internal competition at DEC. When Compaq got a hold of DEC, that DEC sense of internal competition took over Compaq. And then when Compaq, when HP acquired Compaq, that maelstrom of internal competition took over HP. They know was, what they're they, getting we into. We used to call it the red-blue wars, and it was ugly. <laughs> and that's not happening here. That's the first sign. Yeah, I, I would agree, Peter. I, I want to get your thoughts, though. I would agree that this is, I've, I've been trying to sniff out where the wind's blowing on this for a year. And to my knowledge and my insight and sources, it's not going bad at all. It's going great. Uh, the numbers are performing, they're winning some deals. But let's compare to HP, because uh, the, I asked Mark Hurd at their Oracle media event last week, because they were touting number one in every market. So I said, well, there's a digital transformation going on, a whole new way to do business for the next 33 years, not looking back at the past 33 years. Which metrics are you using? Everyone's claiming to be number one at something. So the question is, maybe HP does have it right. Maybe their strategy will work. What are, the, what are going to be those metrics for this next generation. If cloud becomes the connective tissue to data, value of data, and that apps are going to be um, very agile, maybe this decentralized approach from HP might be a better strategy for the growth. Well, I, look, let's, so, so let, let's, uh, I want to get back to the, what's, what's good about what we're seeing and some other things that probably need to be worked on, but, but here's what I'd say, John, uh, and this is what Wikibon believes, that customers is always going to be the most important metric. So the first metric is, is HP gaining customers, is HP losing customers? Is Dell gaining customers, or is Dell losing customers? That's the number one most important metric, always will be, as far as I'm concerned. But the second one is, and, and this, and, and I'll, I'll presage something I'm going to talk about in a little bit. The second one is, I'll call it data under management. If we think about, if we think about this notion of data as an asset, data as a source of value, how much does HP, through its yeah. customers, how much data does, it have, does HP have under management? How much data does Dell EMC have under management? And I think that's going to be an important way of thinking about the intensity of the relationships, which relationships are going to steer towards which types of environments, is it going to be a procurement relationship or a real strategic relationship? By procurement, I mean it's fundamentally focused on driving cost out of the deal. Strategic, I mean it's fundamentally focused by jointly creating value. So this notion of data under management, to me, is going to be something that we're going to be talking about in five years. So Bill Schmarzo, a friend of both of ours, was, came by the set before we came on here, and, and he's the dean of big data, as coined by the Cube, but now has taken on his own, like he's actually a dean now, teaching big data. We are talking about some of the research that you're doing and taking a stand on, it's important, I want to put a plug in for the Wikibon research team that you're leading, is the business value of data. Oh, and that you're looking at data as a valuation mechanism, not an accounting compliance thing, and this is something I think is way ahead of the curve, so props to you guys for putting the stake in the ground, to your point. The new metric might just be the valuation of how they use data, whether that's customer data, product services data, uh, application development concepts, to reconfiguring how they do business. And it's the reconfigure that's the smart, that's the absolute right word. So, from our perspective, John, the difference between a business and a digital business is a business uses data one way, a digital business uses data another way. A business uses data as an, something to just handle coordination administration. Bookkeeping. Yeah, exactly. A digital business uses data as a strategic asset to differentiate how they engage their markets. That's where the industry's going, and that's what we want to talk about. And by about. the way, in, in previous business constructs or business books people have, might have read over the years, certainly you know, the Peter Druckers and so on, management consultants, never actually factored data into the value chains. Oh, they did. Of they did, they did, they just didn't actually. So Drucker, for example, did. Digital Drucker, data? Oh, he talked about information and the role that information okay, I stand played. correct. Herbert Simon talked about this kind of stuff 50 years. Unfortunately, it all got lost when we went through things like, uh, geez, you know, there was a very famous economist who said in the late 80s, uh, information technology shows up everywhere but in the productivity numbers. Okay. So, you old guys. I remember that, you know. I remember that so, quote. So, the idea ultimately is we now have to get very discreet and very specific about what that means. And that's a challenge. But let, let's come back to, let's come back to at least what we think is really working here, if, if I may. Absolutely, so go ahead. So, the first thing is, uh, at a more tactical level, Number one is the hyperconverged story is exciting. And it's starting to come together. And again, I'm not, we're not seeing tension between the folks that are selling servers and the folks that are doing hyperconverged. Both are introducing new technology that are going to create new opportunities for customers, and they're not 
as, as, as your good friend, Michael Dell said a couple times over the past year here in theCUBE, we are not going to artificially constrain any of our businesses. And as Amazon said at reInvent, if you're going to do it at scale, eventually you're going to put it in hardware. And he wants to demonstrate that all this great software stuff is happening, that ultimately Dell's going to be the leader at designing these new capabilities into the hardware, and he wants to show how that's going to show up in all his product lines. I, I, it, that's a great point. I think the most interesting dynamic I've been seeing out of the interviews we've been doing the last two days is that uh, the, the, the problem Dell has to struggle with now, and it'll be interesting to watch how they, how they figure this out, is all of their, uh, used to be called the Federation, now they're called the Strategic Business Alliances, I think. <laughs> uh, the, you know, the, uh, <laughs> the VMwares, the RSAs, the, uh, uh, the Pivotals. Uh, how are they going to make sense of those in the context of this bigger whole? Uh, on, for, on the one hand, they've got some competing uh, uh, priorities here. Dell has a very strong relationship with, uh, with Microsoft. VMware is a competitor to Microsoft. So you've got to figure out how to get those, how to, how to make sense of those different alliances. Pivotal is potentially a competitor to Microsoft. Uh, potentially. What, Microsoft is in the past <laughs> business? Yeah. No, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it's, it it's going to compete. So, you, so you've got, a, you, you've got some, some paradoxes here in the businesses that Dell has acquired. They really still, I sense they still haven't made sense of what they're going to yeah, do with them. Great point. I mean, first of all, you guys are pros and we have a historical view here of the collective intelligence of, uh, of all of us old guys here. We've seen a lot of ways, but Rob Hofe wrote an article on SiliconANGLE, our editor-in-chief Rob Hofe, who's also an industry veteran and journalist himself. After the Oracle media event, the Headline reads, in Oracle's cloud pitch to enterprises, comma, an echo of a bygone tech era. And his point with this story is, and I want to get your reaction to this, I think we're seeing a trend here, you guys are teasing out here. We're kind of going back down to the old tech days. You were the editor-in-chief of Computer World back in the day, with the mainframe world and then the minis. You're seeing Marius Haas on here using words like single pane of glass, one throat to choke, end to end we're almost seeing the bygone era coming back again where maybe they might have the right trade. Certainly Oracle saying, hey, you know, reorganize our sales force. So the question, is the cloud the decentralized mainframe? Is it now the new centralized with edge, intelligent edge? Is that, are we going back to the old ways in a way, not fully, but unifying the sales forces? So, the computing industry Thoughts. has been on an inexorable march to greater utilization of public infrastructure. What an economist would say is we've always found ways to reduce asset specificities. I buy something and I apply it to one purpose. I can't apply it to another purpose. Software changes that. Commodity pricing and hardware changes that. Public infrastructure changes that. So we're going to continue to see that inexorable march to the use of public infrastructure or stuff that looks like public infrastructure, and that's going to continue. And the industry's always been very, very good at that. That does not mean, however, that we're going to have one supplier. So what we're seeing is a lot of FUD right now. Amazon FUD, Dell FUD, Oracle FUD. There is a real tension in the model. And the real tension is, more than likely, the future is going to be composites of services operating on multiple different cloud-like instances, including on-premise, and who's going to offer the best end-to-end -end control plane? Paul, I want to get your thoughts, because you remember, go back to the days, they, IBM had SNA network stack, DEC had DECnet, we had, they had proprietary stacks, cloud, Azure stack, this stack, that. Are we seeing this again? Your thoughts? Well, any, I, any... I think Peter's absolutely right, but the variable, and you're right, we are seeing this again. We're seeing, trying to return to simplicity, because what IT organizations have been wrestling with for the last 20 years is everything is just getting more complex. There's more vendors, there's more piece parts, and they've got to fit them all together, and it sucks. And so they want, they want <laughs> someone to simplify this. Now, cloud vendors simplify it on, on one level, but software-defined on another level. We've been talking here about software-defined storage, about software-defined networking, uh, massive virtualization, and that's on, a, on an open source, or, or at least an open API based uh, uh, model, which I think is the twist here. Are we going back to the days of IBM? Yeah, but IBM, but the IBM may actually be software defined. Or five different companies that look like IBM. Yeah, see, I, I'm not, <laughs> I, I know what you're saying, Paul, I'm not going to disagree with you, but here's the observation. But you disagree with them. <laughs> no, 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 I'm, I'm going I'm I'm okay. to put a slightly different spin on it. It used to be that the most valuable asset in an IT organization was the mainframe. And the entire organization was organized and the interactions with the business were organized and put in place to handle the value of that mainframe. We are not going back to a day 
where the IT organization, the way business uses IT, is organized around the mainframe as an asset, or even around the provision of infrastructure as an asset. We are going to start seeing organization and frameworks that are fundamentally built around this idea of data as an asset. And that is going to be a lot more okay. complex, with a lot more buyers, and a lot more opportunities for differentiation and creating value. So we will see more complexity in IT at the software and the use case level, less complexity at the infrastructure Which is why level. machine learning and automation is a lot of hype, but to Paul, I'm going to get your point and tie Peter's point together and introduce uh, um, Jeff Bezos' comment last week on uh, NDC he mentioned that most things tend, take 10 years to, to bake out in terms of getting things right, 10 year kind of horizon, kind of order of magnitude. But he says, all these startups say they have disruptive technology. It's not their technology that's disruptive, it's what the customer is disrupted. So that's we're right. talking about customers being disrupted. It's not some company having disruptive technology. And disrupting. Well, so and, are, and, and so are we saying that customers are being disrupted by reconfiguring their businesses, hence what the mainframe disrupted, a new way to do things. We're seeing cloud and data as a new way to do things, so that's causing some reconfiguration and disruption that allows them to say, shit, just when I thought it was simple, it got more complex. No, but, but, the, but the disruptive element is the data, as Peter says. I mean, the machines are becoming, uh, the machines are already a commodity. Uh, the, the, with open source, the platforms are a commodity. What's disruptive is how you use the data in different ways. And to your point, Peter, yes, it's going to be a much more complex world. Much because more. there's a lot more data, and that's there's a right. lot more things and we can data, do with data. data can, that's exactly right, we can do so much more with data. So again, let's go back to the fundamental metric that at least I suggested. Who gets more customers? Yeah. There are going to be more buyers of this stuff in five years than there are today. More buyers in the sense that within an organization, there's going to be more people involved in the decision, mm -hmm. and there's going to be more businesses, because if this stuff actually works, the transaction costs are going to go down, and you can then organize your businesses and institutionalize how you do work differently, so you can have more partnerships, all that means that fundamentally, what we're talking about here is going to lead to greater complexity in business, greater opportunity, therefore. But what I've always said, and I don't know if you've heard this, Paul, but I know you have, John, and I've said it on theCUBE, that the, the fundamental demarcation is that the first 50 years of this industry featured known process, unknown technology, and what do we focus on? The technology. What's the next 50 years? Unknown process, known technology. What are we going to focus on? How to build that software, how to handle those data assets. What are we going to focus less attention on? The technology. technology. What does everybody want to talk about at this show? The technology. technology. That's a disconnect. So <laughs> going to one of the things that we now have to think about from a Dell EMC standpoint is, Where's the story about how Dell is going to appreciate the value of your data assets over time? And we need more of that. And so let me point speed. out, you, know, I, you didn't mention IBM, but one company that is doing that well right now, they aren't getting the business benefit for it yet, is IBM, where they are really taking, they are not talking technology, I mean, they don't talk about Power 8 anymore. They, they talk about Watson, they talk about what you can do with analytics, they talk about smart, a smarter planet. Um, they haven't been able to, to turn this into a successful business yet, but they're doing, well, I think, exactly what you're talking they about. Well, product, they have some product challenges. I mean, right. I, so let's get back down to the customer thing. I like that angle. You got to have the customer, you got the products that customers will be buying. That's the value exchange that customers will value, and then hence buy your service or product. Andy Jassy and Pat Gelsinger, when they did the re, uh, Amazon deal, VMware, Jassy, Andy Jassy, CEO of AWS said to me, we are customer focused. So I believe that you're right on this 100%. Whoever can get the customers, and this is not about who's the better stack. If the customers like it, they're going to buy it. And, and very importantly, John, they are going to invest in it to make it valuable in their business. And that's what you want. You want to see your customers become a centerpiece of value creation in your ecosystem. And I think Amazon Web Services it proves that the dark horse could come out of the nowhere and be the behemoth that they are because they serve the customers. So that's the second thing that I'm missing at this show. And I know, I think I know why, is where is the additional details, even a little bit more, about VMware and AWS? Now I know that they're going to wait for the they VMware They showed a little preview that's in the keynote. They're still baking out. Yeah, but it would be nice that's to one have of those, a little bit more. That's one of those, those tough relationships they need to manage, that's right? Exactly I mean, right. VMware and IBM also have, a, also have an alliance. They, they, have, they are allied with their foes now through the acquisition. Uh, the, um, the point about, um, uh, about the value of data, 
you know, I think Amazon has done a good job of, of building platforms that are very flexible for customers to use, but they, they abstract a lot of the underlying All right, so but with the data, I want to just double down on that for a second and get your reaction thoughts on, obviously one of the themes here is IOT, and we heard Michael Dell saying it's going to be centralized, pushed out to the edge. You got a research from Wikibon, right. Intelligent Edge. Uh, you and David Floyd and the rest of the team doing some real amazing work at wikibon.com, check it out, subscription required. What's the edge strategy? What does that actually mean for IT practitioners out there? Uh, it's certainly, we heard from Basque Iyer, who's the CIO of Dell, said most CIOs are conservative and don't usually miss, jump on these waves. They miss mobile, they miss some other waves. His mandate was CIOs, don't miss the IOT wave. So what is this IOT, this edge of the network thing, mean for a CIO? Well, the first thing is in, in hardcore circumstances, many CIOs aren't even involved in the edge. So if you take a look, if you go into where a lot of the edged domains are really crucial, you see a plant manager that's more responsible for what's going on in the edge than the CIO. The CIO's handling the corporate systems, the plant manager's having what's actually happening at the edge. The, off, the operational technology stuff. So the first thing is we're going to see a slow circling of the IT and OT organizations about who's going OT to OT meaning operational technology. Operational technology. Just as we saw a slow circling back in the 1990s when TCP IP came in and blew away deck and blew away everybody and started blowing away the telecom divisions or telecoms functions with inside large enterprises. So you think that IOT is going to be as disruptive as TCP IP was in standardizing the, in the network layer? Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, it's going to be. It's going to have an enormous impact because there's so many, no, so many new sources. The data is going to have how to think about it, and that was the second point I was going to make, John. Is we do not currently have architectural standards in place for thinking about how this stuff is going to come together. That's something that David Floyer and I and the Wikibon team are working on, and I hope to come up with. I hope to come out with some research, actually probably next month, on what we call automation zones or data zones, or probably edge zones which is how do you, just as we think about security zones today, how do we think about edge zones? Where the edge zone is defined by a, a, a moment, an automation moment, cannot have data outside of that zone. And that needs to become an architectural principle where OT and IT can work together and say, what data has to be in that zone? I'll make sure my data gets there, you make sure your data gets there, we'll figure out how control happens, and that's how we drive this thing forward. Well, just to give you um, a prop here on the, on the cube here is, Wikibon was right about flash, they were right about hyperconvergence and convergent infrastructure. Big bets early on that were kind of like, people were like, what? And certainly vSAN, ServiceSAN, although some people will disagree with that. They were right about the edge. Private were right. Cloud. Now you're right about, I think you're right on, way right on the edge, and you're way right on value of data. Yeah. I think those are two stands and, that you're and, taking and let's that give will great be. Great props to David Floyer, who was a catalyst for thinking many of these things yeah. through. All right, Paul, final, final word from you. Obviously, you know, as a, as a veteran, you've covered it all. Okay. What's your take? I mean, what's the what's the how's the wind blowing? What's your vibe? What's your instinct tell you of what's happening? I think it's generally good, but it's hard to tell from conferences. As you know, John, the reason most conferences are so boring is that there's no tension, there's, there's no conflict. It's all good, it's all everybody's happy and everybody's doing a great job. And that's the very same thing that <laughs> rah, we're seeing rah, here. Kool-Aid injection. <laughs> One thing I can't help but notice is on the keynote, if you look at the keynote agenda for the three days, there's not a single customer on the, on the uh, keynote agenda, which, uh, which I think is a problem. Right? I, think, I, think, I don't think that's, that says good things about where Dell is really focusing its, its message right now. You want to have, at most uh, big company conferences, there's lots and lots of, of customers who come up on stage. I think Dell is still thinking about, I mean, it's a technology-focused company. I think they're, they're thinking about technology integration right so now. So speeds How and they're going to make the, yeah, there's, you well, hear a lot of speeds and Everybody wants to be the most important thing in the enterprise, and they, they still want hardware to be the most well, important Well, yeah, I think, I mean, just, I would agree with you 100%, but I, I just think just in this acquisition, I mean, sorry, merger of equals, they have a lot of herding cats going on right now. There's yes. a lot of herding of you know, portfolio and not a lot of overlap, but I can see them kind of making room on the stage for that. But I do agree, I mean, customers do tell the best story. And in the long run, that, that's, as Peter said, that is what is going to make the difference. Right. Are the customers Guys, happy? Guys, amazing exchange. Thanks so much, Peter, for coming on and taking Absolutely. some time out of your busy schedule to come on theCUBE and share your insight, uh, the data on theCUBE. Paul, as always, we have another three days, third day of our three days of coverage here in theCUBE. Uh, great commentary, great analysis, more live coverage from day three of Dell EMC World 2017. We'll be right back, stay with us. We'll be right back after this short break. Ah.